And I'm very sorry for some of the early on technical difficulties. We welcome all of our members from all over the world and throughout the United States and Canada. Um, this meeting meets every week, all the way through June 30th, 2021, same time, same station. We have started the registration November 1st for our classes. Um, the registrations are coming in very strongly. The first meeting here is, uh, the first class is by Rosemary Orchard. It's next Saturday. And it's on uh, a week, it's a week from Saturday, excuse me, on the 9th of January, I think the 9th of January, and using Zoom and FaceTime and COVID-19. Uh, uh, this should be a great meeting. Uh, Rosemary is a uh, uh, world famous uh, technical speaker for Apple. And um, she, this should be an outstanding presentation. So if you're not registered yet, please do for January 9th. The second and third meeting, uh, which you can sign up for also, and you can sign up for all the classes now, but uh, the second and third meeting is by uh, Jeff Bohr. Uh, Jeff Bohr is a uh, member of our club, a board member, and will be teaching the Big Sur class classes on the 16th and 23rd. Uh, we still are asking those that don't feel comfortable yet, do not install uh, a Big Sur. I would say probably by the first or by the uh, third or fourth of the year, um, I'll give you, I'll send you notice. I'm going to check with Dennis and Jeff and I'm sure you'll be able to go ahead and install. Right now, Super Duper does not work with Big Sur and uh, I haven't heard anything to the contrary, but uh, those of you that uh, feel confident, uh, I would start installing. But those that don't feel confident, please wait a little while. Marsha, are you with us? Will you unmute yourself and talk about the survey monkey ballot? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, the ballot will be coming out next week check your junk mail. It's coming from secretary at nmug.com or .net. So it's pretty easy. It's a yes or no or abstain for the questions. And there's a place for a write-in. And we would like them returned by January 22nd at 8 p.m. That's it. Pretty yeah, simple. please, uh, as soon as you get the ballot, uh, just uh, get it out of the way, please, and uh, send it back. It's a very simple process. I'd say if you don't, if you haven't seen it by Wednesday, check your junk mail. Thanks, Marsha. Um, like I've said in the past, any problems or issues or information you need about Zoom, please contact uh, Eckert. Eckert is not with us today. Uh, he's not on his way to moving to Ocala. Eckert is remaining with the club. We can now have members from all over the world, and uh, we do. And um, so wherever you live, you can be a member. On January the 13th, we'll have our buddy Mitch back, uh, the expert on the iPhone, iPad, Apple Watch. It'll be primarily a Q&A, but he's also going to talk about uh, his happy experience with the uh, mini home pod. And uh, it seems to be a, a great item. It's getting raving reviews. It uh, is selling like crazy. And it's uh, probably gonna be the, uh, the number one hot item for Apple for 2021. Also, he's gonna talk about a, a, a cup holder. And I've, I've uh, noticed this many times because I get a lot of advertising from WeatherTech WeatherTech is a US made company. Everything is made here in the United States. And they, ha they happen to make this great cup holder and, he's, and uh, Mitch is gonna talk about it. Uh, also, George, uh, Sheeta is going to do a couple of uh, product demos. Okay, great. That's gonna, I think gonna be on that new hard drive that she uh, 
talked about briefly last week. Yes. Okay. Sheeta, you want to say a few words about Terry? Yes, I would like to welcome you all to the kickoff of the NMUG uh, presentation series, Wednesday presentation series. Uh, we have an honored guest, Terry White, who is the worldwide design and photography evangelist for Adobe. This should be an amazing meeting. This meeting is going to be open to other attendees as well. So we expect to have a larger audience. Uh, this is going to just be a wonderful, um, wonderful for us to be able to have Terry. Uh, and I hope you join us. And if you know of anyone who would also like to join, please send a email to Eckert or myself with that person's name and email address so that we can add them to the registration list. Uh, looking forward to that and thank you all. All, all yours. Mm -hmm. So I have to reshare my screen. Okay. Um, today's meeting uh, is 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 Josh Summers all the way from Taiwan. Is that correct, Josh? Uh, it's actually Thailand, but close. Or Thailand. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thailand. That's right. And um, it's it's uh, not close to Naples. It's on the other side of the world. Um, I actually found Josh. I was somehow uh, looking for information on VPNs, and I found this outstanding YouTube video. And uh, after watching it, oh. I said, "I." What was that noise? I guess it was let just me, somebody. Yeah. Let me ask that everyone please mute your microphones. Thank you very much. Am I muted now? No, you're you're fine, George. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So anyway, I, I ran across this fabulous YouTube video on VPNs, and I said to myself after I watched it, I said I got to get this guy to talk, talk to our group about VPN and uh, security and so forth. And I left a comment on the YouTube uh, on his YouTube site. And uh, they got back to me right away. Uh, somebody got back to me representing Josh. And um, then I got, she got me in touch with Josh. And uh, Josh agreed to uh, do this meeting, which is very nice of him since it's uh, a sort of a strange time, a day before New Year's. And we're, I think you're gonna like this meeting a lot. Uh, this guy is terrific. And I'm thrilled to have them and welcome. And you go ahead, Josh. Great. Um, all right. Is there anything I need to do to get myself on the screen? I mean, I'm I'm just going to be doing my video. I don't have a screen to share. Oh, wait a minute, um, uh, Sheeta. What does you he have are, to do? Yeah, you are a co-host. So if you click on the share screen button, the green share screen button at the bottom of your screen, you can share your desktop with us. Okay, well, I, I'm actually, I've got it all set up through my video feed. So can I just have my video be the, the big thing? Can you, sh what, so where is your video showing? Well, I'm, I'm, I see myself right now. I'm just like my, my face to face, my video, what, what I'm doing right now. Okay, okay. you're on right now. I am, great. Yes, yeah, we see you right now. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And I am excited to be here as uh, I believe it was George who introduced me. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, all right. As George said, I am all the way in Thailand right now, which is a 12 hour time difference, which means that it is currently 1145 PM and I will be finishing here at about 1 AM. So I have my cup of coffee here and I am ready to get moving and get going even though it is very late and tomorrow night's going to be another late night but you know that's just the way it goes and i'm excited about it uh, i got the email saying and and the way that it was described to me and i really loved this is you guys were described to me as retired but very alive and that was that was uh, i thought that was a perfect description of exactly 
who you guys are, and I'm looking forward to hopefully sharing and maybe teaching a little bit in the process. As was shared before, um, I am Josh Summers, and as you can see here, I've got this YouTube channel. I also have a website uh, called All Things Secured. Um, if you have a chance afterwards, I recommend or I hope that you'll be able to go onto the YouTube channel and just kind of check out a number of the videos. Uh, my goal, I don't, I'm not a super IT expert. What I am very good at, I hope, is being able to take complex subjects and make them easy to understand for most people. So um, whenever I create a video, I create it for my sister or for my mom or for somebody that, um, that I would want to understand something that, that is maybe a little too more complex than they would normally um, think about. So I'm gonna start right now, first of all, saying thank you to George, Michael, Eckert, and Cheetah for this opportunity, and then share with you back in 2018, um, I started, I, I woke up one morning and I had a number of different uh, texts on my phone and I had a lot of different emails that looked something like this. I don't know if you can see this very well. I'll actually go ahead and zoom in. It says suspicious activity in your account. And you can see someone had been trying to log into my account from Florida. Uh, I think it was Halea Gardens. I don't even know how to pronounce that. Halea Gardens, Florida. And it wasn't me, obviously. I was not logging into that. And I spent the next four or five hours, I had gotten locked out of my email, I'd gotten locked out of my banking, I had gotten locked out of so many different accounts, and it was very worrying. It took me hours to unravel all of this, and then to top it all off, I found out later, it was probably a couple hours after that, I got a ping from my credit service that said someone had tried to open a credit card in my name in Florida that same morning. So basically what had happened is they'd gotten access to my email account. And then years before that, I had sent an email to, to, you know, to the IRS that had my social security number on it. And so now that that person who had broken into my email account now had my social security number, my name and my address. And now they were opening up accounts in my name. And so it was, it was it was a very, it was very scary for me, but it was also eye opening. And I've spent the last number of years really trying to increase my online security and privacy. And that's where I'm coming from right now as I share this for you, with you. So I'm going to start by giving you some good and some bad news. All right. And I'll start with the bad news. The bad news is this. If you want to have true, full online security and privacy, you want to be completely anonymous, all that stuff. The reality is you can't use the internet. You should just go ahead and throw your computer away, throw away your phone, throw away your iPad. You shouldn't have any email. You can't do social media. You can't use your smartphone and you can't do mobile banking, et cetera, et cetera. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that you guys do that. I use the internet, I use social media, of course I have email. But what I'm trying to say here is that there's really no true security and privacy and anonymity on the internet. Um, I had a website 10 years ago, I no longer own it, I no longer have it online, and yet there are ways that you can go back and find those things. You can always, the stuff that you put on the internet will always be there somehow. And so that's why you should always be careful about what you put on the internet, what you put on Facebook, and how you do your data. And that's what we're going to be talking about. The good news, however, that I want to share with you is that it's not that hard to set up basic protections um, that will basically put you ahead of probably 80% of the general online population. And that's what I'm going to be talking about this morning, or in my case, this evening, I'm going to cover three different topics. We're going to be talking about your logins, your social media, and then, of course, virtual private networks, which is what I was really asked to come on here and discuss. Uh, but there's a reason that I'm kind of going in that succession, and we're going to be talking about it in this way. Um, in each section, what I want to do is I want to give you a, an action item, something that you can do that's super easy that I recommend you do pretty much today, if you have the chance, or at least this week, as we head into 2021, so that you can be better prepared in your online security and privacy. So let's go ahead and start with our login security. A recent study of passwords, which is sponsored by Ubico, revealed that while 66% of respondents think that passwords are important, only 
only 51% of people know how to manage their passwords. And that same, same 51% reuses passwords on many of their main accounts. Um, so, I mean, I don't know about you guys. Uh, I personally have, I think I counted last week, I have over 300 online logins. That includes my email, my bank, social media, and every little other thing that requires me to create a login. Um, and it's hard to keep track of all your passwords. Um, and I'm sure you've probably faced the same thing. I like to think of it almost like your house. Um, a password's like that key to your house where is that one key going to protect your entire house? Is that going to ensure if you lock your door that you're never ever gonna get broken into? No, of course not. But that key is the first line of defense. And the stronger you can make that key, the better off you're gonna be. In the same way, the same it goes for your passwords. The stronger you can make your passwords, the better off that you're gonna be. So what exactly um, constitutes a strong password? Um, I'm going to name off uh, three different things right here. First is that it has 12 or more characters. Now, again, do you have to have 12 or more characters? No. Um, but this is what is generally considered to be a strong password. You have capitals, you have lowercase, you have uppercase, you have numbers, you have letters, you have special characters. But probably most important is that it is unique. So in other words, you're not using the same password for your email, for your banking, for your investment accounts, and for your Facebook, and for Target when you go into Target. And why is that? Well, we'll take an example of Target being hacked just a couple of years ago. So now if that hacker has access to both your email and that password that you used at Target, and they can, they can associate the two, well, now they can go and try that email and password at hundreds of different places. And if they get access, if you use that same password in your bank or you use that same password on your email, now it doesn't matter how strong that password is because you've reused it, because it's not unique, you are now at risk and you're vulnerable. So that's why I say that you want to have a unique password. Now, what would a strong password look like? I'm going to give you the example, um, and then we're going to talk through a little bit of this. The first, if you see this right here, this is what I would consider to be a strong password. And you look at that, I don't know how well you can see it, but it looks like just this jumble of letters and numbers, but it actually makes sense to me. Why is that? Well, this is actually Mary had a little lamb written out. So it's capital M for Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow and using the amper stand everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Now, obviously this is a long password and yours doesn't have to be that long. It could be a simple phrase that you know, or maybe a verse that you, you know, you really like a Bible verse or some other type of verse that you like that you can create a password out of. Whatever it is, you want to create something that has those long characters and it uses a, a variety of different types of characters. And if you want to make it unique, one of the ways that I do that, and again, I'm just giving you some tips here, is I would take, let's say if I wanted to use this for Facebook, I would put my F, capital F at the beginning, and a K at the end. And so now that is a completely unique password, and I would do the same for a different account over and over and over again. So... Again, I actually use a password manager. I'm not going to go into that now. That's kind of beyond the scope of my presentation here. But if you just needed to create a strong password, that's what you could do. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show you if you wanted to check your password, uh, you can go to allthingssecure.com slash password dash checker. Uh, this is a tool that I have on my website. I don't want you to put in your actual password. I wouldn't recommend you do that on any password checker and definitely not mine. But you can put in a password very similar so you can see whether it's a strong password, a very strong password, or it's a weak password. And then you can go in and change that. And then I would say here that my key takeaway for this one section about logins is this. Make sure that your email and banking passwords are both strong and unique. And if they aren't, I suggest that you change those today. 
Uh, you don't, I mean, obviously there are hundreds of other, you know, logins that you have, but the two most important that I would recommend you look at are your banking and your email. If they don't fall under that strong password category or they aren't unique, then that's something if you want to be uh, strengthening your online security and privacy going into 2021, that is what I would do. I would make sure that you're changing your banking password and your um, email password. So that is it for your login. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention here. This is just an extra thing. So don't I don't want to confuse you. But I also wanted to mention that there is something else called a two-factor authentication. I'm not sure. I'm trying to make sure you can see this. This is called a 2FA key. It's kind of like a padlock on your door. So, right, you've got one key that goes into one. That would be your password. And then you have a padlock. Um, the great thing about this, I use this for my email. I use this for any place that allows me to. It's a second factor of authentication. What happens is, let's say I log into Facebook um, from a new computer and I have to give them my password. And what Facebook does is it says, oh, okay, you did the right password. Now we need you to do a second factor of authentication or you know, authenticate yourself again using a physical key. And what I have to do is I have to insert this into my computer and then press the button. And with, if somebody doesn't have this, they can't log into my account. Uh, so it adds an extra layer of protection so that if someone wanted to log into my email, they would literally have to not only figure out and hack my password, they would have to mug me and take this key and then use that key. So these are other ways that you can secure your login. But again, I don't want to confuse you or try to get you to do things that are beyond what you feel comfortable doing. It, the most important thing that you can do right now is just make sure that your banking it and email password logins are uh, as strong and as secure as possible. All right, so now we're moving on to our social media privacy. I, uh, a couple, I was actually just yesterday, I was sitting down um, and I decided I would do a little bit of research. Um, I don't know, hopefully, I don't know how many of you have Facebook and Instagram profiles. If you don't, then you can just listen and enjoy because I'm going to be sharing with you uh, an interesting kind of case study here. But if you do, then you need to pay special attention here because I went on to this lady. I found this lady. Her name is Patty. Um, if you can't see all the text, it really doesn't matter because I'm not trying to um, give away her identity because frankly, I have no idea who she is. I'm not connected with her in any way. I'm not friends of friends with her in any way. I just found her by doing a random search. And here's what I found out. I found out where she went to high school. I found out where she currently lives. I found out who she's married to. I found out her mother's maiden name. And I got to see photos of all of her kids, including her teenage daughter, and many, many other details about where she worked and all this stuff. This was public information that was available just by me searching. Now, on, by contrast, here's a look at my Facebook account. If you were not friends with me, which I don't believe any of you are connected with me on Facebook, but since you aren't, this is what you would see. If you can't read it, it basically, you can see my picture and you can see my name, but it has no workplace. It shows no school, it shows no location, and it shows absolutely no relationships. If you look on my photos, you see absolutely no photos of my boys. I have two boys. Uh, but you see no photos if you aren't friends with me. You see no videos that I've taken unless you are friends with me. And then, of course, I also don't show any of my friends. So unless you are a friend or a friend of a friend, you can't even find me very easily on Facebook. And again, that may seem like a little much, but unless you're a celebrity or unless you have a good reason to want to have yourself public on these type of platforms, there's really no reason to make things that public, to make yourself that public on uh, these platforms like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, all these different places. The only exception I would say would be LinkedIn, but I think for most of you guys, LinkedIn isn't even really a place where you would be <laughs> at anyway. So what are, what's something you can do here? What are we, uh, without getting too far into the weeds, how can you change your current privacy settings on Facebook. And I'm gonna show you one thing. There are so many other things that we can do, but I'm just gonna show you one thing to try to make this as simple as possible, all right? 
If you were to go into your Facebook account and go into facebook.com slash settings, or if you go up here, I'm going to see if I can um, circle right up here, you'll see there's that um, arrow button. And if you were to click on that, you would find privacy or you'd find settings. And then what's going to happen is, let me see if I can pull off here, you're going to look for this place right here that says limit your audience for posts you've shared with friends or friends or public. Now, right now, a lot of the stuff that you've already posted, if you've posted anything on Facebook, is probably by default set to public, which means, like I showed you with Patty, anybody and their brother and their dog can see it. So if you were to go and click that on the right side, that blue text that says limit past posts, if you were to click that, it would retroactively go back through all of your posts and all of your photos and turn them to private so that only your friends can see it. And that is probably one of the best things you can do today on your Facebook account. Now, Facebook, when you click that, is going to say, oh, wait, wait, are you sure you want to do this? Um, you can't undo it. And the truth is, I, there's no, I, I don't know. The only thing I can imagine what I did is I went back to one of my posts that was a video that I wanted to make public anyway. And so after I limited my posts, I went back to that one post and turned it back into the public. But it's much easier to do it this way where you go through your Facebook and you just turn everything into private. And then if you want something public, you, you do that individually. And again, that might be beyond the scope of this presentation, but I want you to think about doing that right now. Um, let's see here. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and start right here. Um, the takeaway here is that if you can set, if you have Instagram, set your profile to private. If you are on Facebook, then make all your settings friends only if possible. Within those Facebook settings, you're gonna find something called a privacy checkup. And that is something where you can actually go in and it will ask you a series of questions. It'll make it very easy for you to set your privacy uh, to be just friends. And that's the best thing that you can do when you're dealing with any of these public social media profiles is to go through and do that type of security checkup to make sure you're not exposing things that you don't need to expose because people can use that information. So for example, with Patty, the fact that I now know her mother's maiden name, if I were to go into her bank and her bank were to ask me as a, you know, and I were to find her, somehow be able to hack her password and it asks me, what is your mother's maiden name? Well, now I know it because I, it was given to me freely on Facebook. So you need to be careful about what you put on social media. All right, here we are. Let, let's let's kind of, uh, we're not going to wrap things up here, but we're going to now next move on to VPNs. Um, and there's a reason I kind of set this at the last, and we're going to spend a good bit of time here. And if you have questions, that's great. I would recommend that you either put them in the chat now, and then I'll address them later so that you don't forget. Or if you want to just write them down, I'll do my best to answer them. I'll set aside some time at the end of the presentation that you can ask any questions having to do with VPNs. But a lot of you are probably familiar or at least have heard of this guy, Edward Snowden, um, who leaked a lot of stuff with the NSA. He worked in the government and he leaked a lot of hot, top secret documents that revealed the fact that the NSA, like many governments around the world, spy on their, um, on their citizens. And there was a lot of very eye-opening information that came out because of these leaks, some that was good to know, some that was probably more than we needed to know. But what it boiled down to was learning a few things. One, the government is able to see more of what we do online than we realize. But probably equally important was that we found out that the government is not able to hack encryption. And you can bet that as the US government is doing this, the China Chinese government is doing this, the Russian government is doing this, any major government, even European governments, are doing something similar for the sake of national security. Um, but what does that mean for us when we're dealing with our encryption? Uh, encrypting data, meaning making sure that it is private and that it is secured and that nobody can read it, even if they were to intercept that data that we're passing back and forth over the internet. And so if I'll go back to this again, there was a, um, a new story written on Wired that basically summed up this portion of a, something that was revealed in these leaks that said these methods, 
used by the NSA don't involve cracking the algorithms and the math underlying the encryption, but rather relying upon circumventing and otherwise undermining encryption. So what this means is that the encryption that we have, the encryption that I'm about to talk about, has not been cracked by the government. It, it, is, it is good. All right, the, the encryption is good, but that doesn't mean that, okay, well, great, I've, we're encrypted. We don't have to worry about anything because the government has found other ways or there are, you know, hackers have found other ways to circumvent that, whether that's getting a back door through Facebook and Google or other ways that, that they know in order to circumvent these, um, the, the encryption here. I'm not trying to scare you, definitely not trying to do that. I just want to get a little bit of a reality check. And one of the things that I want to talk about then so that we understand this is basically encryption 101. Or better said, I'm probably going to say how your, how your computer connects to the internet. So let's say that this is your computer. You can see here that you are going to type in, let's say that you're going to go to the Google homepage. So you go into your browser and you type in Google. And what's going to happen is it's the first thing that happens is what's known as a DNS query. DNS stands for domain name system. The, the internet doesn't work using text like we do. It, it works using numbers. And so what needs to happen is the computer needs to find where to get that website. And the DNS server is basically an address book. It tells your computer where that is. So you say, hey, who is google.com? The DNS server replies back and says, oh, it's at, you'll find it at this number. And it gives a numeric address, which is the address for the DNS address for that website. So now your computer will connect. It will go find that uh, web server and it will say, hey, I want to serve the Google homepage. And that server will say, you found the right place. Here it is. And it will send all that data back. So that's a very simplified, obviously, very simplified look at how your computer connects to the internet. Now, in past time, what has happened is you've got this uh, plain text that has happened between your computer and that web server. So that if somehow, let's say you were at a coffee shop or you were in a public place and you were connecting to the internet, it was sent in plain text so that if I were to intercept your, you know, your internet connection, I could actually read what you're receiving, what you're typing in and all that stuff. But things have changed, thankfully. And now most websites are served in what's known as HTTPS. So you know, when you type out a URL, you've got the www whatever. Well, before that, you have this HTTPS encryption. And it looks something like this. So when you type in a web page, uh, you're, it, it will probably default to HTTPS if the website allows that. And more than often than not in your browser, you'll just see that green check mark uh, in the top left. If it's not, an, if it's not a, an HTTPS encrypted website, um, a lot of these web browsers now will actually say not secure on it. And you wanna be very careful about what you do on those type of websites. As a matter of fact, I would recommend you just go ahead and close that browser if you see that not secure come up because those are websites that you don't really want to be visiting. So when you've got this encryption, what this means is when you're connecting to your bank and your bank is always gonna use HTTPS, then that means that that encryption, that that uh, anything that you're sending between your bank's web server and your computer will be encrypted by HTTPS. Okay, so I'm, I'm telling you all this for a reason. I'm kind of laying a foundation because what that also means is your DNS request is not encrypted. Why would that matter? Well, let's say that you're visiting google.com Whoever is, let's say, at that coffee shop or your ISP, your internet service provider, whether that's Comcast or Verizon or whoever does your internet, uh, wherever you're at, they actually can see your DNS request. They can tell, oh, this person went to Google. This person went and visited this website. Now, once you actually connect to that website, let's say you were connecting to your bank, Chase, when you type in chase.com and you have that DNS request, you're that the fact that you're going to visit Chase can easily be seen, but HTTPS encrypts everything else that you do once you connect to the Chase website. So then what does a VPN do? A VPN basically encrypts all of it. 
It encrypts your DNS request. It encrypts all of the traffic going back and forth between the web server. And more, more, I guess the best way to say it is that it's a safety net of encryption. HTTPS does a great job of encrypting your data. A VPN adds kind of that safety net, that second layer, and then it also hides your DNS requests. Um, now, hopefully I've, I've tried my best to explain this as, as simply as possible. These are, I mean, there's so much more complexity than even I'm sharing with you right here. But I wanna to explain to you the, the advantages of using a VPN. And then I'm gonna let you see my computer as I kind of ex turn on a VPN and show you exactly what I'm doing and why. So the advantages of using a VPN, first of all, like I mentioned, is that, that encryption safety net. You want to, especially if you're dealing with sensitive data, let's say some of you are sending, um, let's say a document having to do with your will or having to do with uh, IRS stuff or something like that. I always just turn on my VPN just as that safety net. Um, and definitely for public networks. I had somebody ask me earlier, you know, if, you know, if HTTPS is so good, why do you have to use a VPN on a Wi-Fi network? Well, you don't. Uh, HTTPS is strong enough, but that that VPN, it adds that second layer of protection and it allows everything that you're doing to be encrypted so that they can't even see what websites you're trying to visit, which there can be information derived from that kind of stuff too. You want to hide your ge geographic location. You may not know this, but your device, whether it's your computer, your phone, your tablet, whatever, is assigned what's known as an IP address whenever it connects to the internet. And there's a lot of information that's given with that IP address. Um, most importantly, your physical location. Now, it's not like you see in the Hollywood movies where they could you know, probably detail down into you know, your, your physical address, like at your home using just your IP, but it will tell you, okay, you are in Naples, Florida using this uh, internet service provider based on the IP address. So by connecting to a VPN, you hide that IP address depending on what server you connect to, let's say I connect to a server in Dallas, it'll make it look like I'm in Dallas. Or if I connect to a server in France, it'll make it look like I'm in France. There's a couple of reasons you might wanna do that. First of all, just to hide your geographic locations so that you know, it makes it harder for these services like Facebook and Google to track, track you wherever you're going. But the other is um, what's known as location spoofing. Uh, I don't know how applicable this will be to you guys. For me right now, it's super applicable. Let me explain. I'm in Thailand and my family, I've got two young boys. They love Disney movies. Oh my goodness. The, the new soul movie. I don't know if you guys have seen this soul movie. Um, it is it's great. But the problem is that Disney plus doesn't stream in Thailand. I'm a paying us subscriber. I'm a US citizen, I've got my US passport, and I pay for this service, and they won't let me stream it because I'm in Thailand. So what do I do? I connect to a VPN, connect to a server in the United States, and boom, now Disney Plus thinks that I'm in the United States and I'm able to stream those services. So uh, there may be, like there are different Netflix libraries. If you were to connect to France and then open up Netflix, there are different movies and shows that are available than there are in the United States. Uh, or if you wanna watch the BBC iPlayer, you'd have to connect to a server in the UK. All of these are different uses for uh, a VPN. Um, there are obviously plenty of others, but these are the primary three uses uh, that I've really, that I use it for. And there are tons of VPN services. I'm not going to go through that many of them, but I did want to just show you a little bit of what my VPN looks like. I'm just going to give you an example here. So I'm going to show you my screen. Uh, I'm going to show you, I, I, use, I use a handful of VPNs, uh, ExpressVPN, NordVPN. I'm going to show you Surfshark right now. So you can see right here, I'm going to close this up. You can see I've installed the Surfshark software. I already have a, um, a, a, an account, so I've subscribed to Surfshark. If you haven't, you'd have to go onto their website and sign up to subscribe. And then once you've downloaded it, you're gonna see that I've basically got a list of countries. And what that is, is that is different countries where I can connect to a server. 
So let me just show you very quickly. If I were to go into here and go, what is my IP address? It's going to, I'm not connected to a VPN right now, right? So mind you, I'm not connected to a VPN. So what it's going to show is it's going to show my IP address and my location where I'm at in Thailand. Well, I don't want to show that. So let's say I want to go to France. So I'm going to connect. You see now that I'm connected to France. So if I were to open back up and go, what is my IP address? I'm going to show any computer anywhere that I visit online is going to look, it's going to look like I'm coming from Marseille in France. You can see right here that it says, oh, this computer is coming from Marseille in France, and that's the IP address. So again, that location spoofing. So I'm going to go ahead. I mean, the great thing about a VPN is it's a very simple software. It's connect, disconnect. I mean, that, that's really all it is. That's all I use it. Once I connect, I usually just close it up and I don't even think about it. I just keep doing whatever I'm doing. Um, but then opening it back up, you can, let's go ahead and look for a moment. I'm just gonna show you some of the settings. The most important setting being um, the protocol. A VPN protocol is essentially just the encryption language. So, you know, there's different languages of all sorts of different things. Well, this is the encryption language. And OpenVPN has been, for at least the last two to three decades, the standard for VPN protocols. But there's a new one that I highly recommend called WireGuard. So if you're going to get a VPN, I would recommend that you go for one that allows for WireGuard connection. Um, Surfshark is one of them. NordVPN is another. Um, there are plenty of others, but I don't want to overwhelm you with choices. I would just say those are two really good ones. Um, and then there's not much that you have to do in terms of your settings. I would just go in, you choose a country. I mean, you can even go back and do the United States and just pick a different city in the United States. You click on that city and you're going to connect to that VPN service. It looks almost identical if I were to show you on my iPad, which if you wanted me to do that later, you can ask me, I can plug in my iPad and show you what it looks like on my iPad, but it looks practically the same. And that's all it is. That's, that's the simplicity of a VPN uh, that hides a lot of the complex what it's doing. But the simplicity is it's very much just choose your server and click connect. And there's a lot of other stuff behind the scenes that's happening that you don't necessarily have to worry about. Okay, so let's look then at, run just a moment, let's look back at potential problems that you might have with a VPN. Again, this is something that came up in kind of my discussions with uh, some of the folks uh, at the, with you guys, is what, what do you do about these different problems? One of them is this problem of an IP address. The fact is that these VPNs are used by millions of people worldwide. And a lot of companies, let's say banks as an example, keep a good list of IP addresses that are known VPN IP addresses. So in other words, I, servers that are always used by, by VPNs. So if I connect to a France server and that server is always known to be used by VPNs, a lot of times that bank will block that connection. So that if I'm on a VPN, let's say I'm connected to my VPN on France, I wouldn't be able to access the uh, my bank. It would say, "Sorry, we don't accept," because they're you know obviously when you're dealing with security and anonymity, as much as what we're doing is perfectly legal and good, there are plenty of other people that are trying to do things that aren't legal and are using a VPN to try to cover their tracks. And so banks, which are obviously on high alert for any fraudulent activity, tend to just say, "You know, if you're using a VPN." we're not going to let you use our website. And they can do that. So that's one of the potential problems that you might run into. How would you get around that problem? Well, I would probably change to a different uh, server and choose different servers until you can find one that might work. Um, if I brought you back into, if I were to bring you right back into my, um, uh, let me see here, I'm gonna show you again, uh, Surfshark. What I'm going to show you is they also allow for static IP addresses. That means it's the same IP address that they have. Um, so you can, if you connect to London 002, uh, or actually, let, do they have London 007? No, that would have been funny. Um, London 002, you can uh, you can always use that one. So that once 
your bank realizes that you always use that VPN IP address, then it might let you back on. Um, but the truth is, like I told you earlier, banks and any other website that uses HTTPS is already using a high level of encryption. So if you aren't able to use your VPN to connect to a bank, then just disconnect from the VPN for a moment and get onto your bank if you absolutely have to. Um, that is one way that you can do it. So that is a, a potential problem with, um, with an, uh, uh, using a VPN. Another is a slower internet connection. So when you're using a VPN, obviously, if you're, let's say, connecting to somewhere in France or Germany or UK and you're in the United States, your, your internet connection is traveling all the way to a server over there and back to wherever that um, web server is. So it's having to travel an extra length of space. It will slow down your internet. Now, possibly you won't notice it. Hopefully, I rarely notice it myself. But it is a problem, especially if you're on a slower internet connection or if you're connecting to, you know, let's say a VPN server that has hundreds of people connected to it as well. So that's a potential problem you need to be looking out for is um, a slower internet connection. I also want to mention a trust factor here. Um, what you're essentially doing when you use a VPN is you're saying, I don't trust my government or I don't trust uh, the public Wi-Fi that I'm uh, using. I don't trust my internet service provider to not, you know, let's say snoop in on what I'm doing or sell my information. But you are replacing that distrust with those entities with a trust in this VPN service. You are essentially saying, I trust this VPN service more than I trust these other entities. Uh, and in most cases, that's, that is perfectly fine. But you have to understand that these companies can have failures as well. These, these companies, um, most of them don't even tell you who owns them. And so, you know, there's, there have been instances where a VPN has been found out to be owned by a state actor like China. They owned a couple of VPNs and they were using that to kind of spy on what people were doing. Um, and that's something that's why when you're using a VPN, you don't want to use one, a free VPN, and two, one that isn't highly recommended or one that isn't, you know, has been used by lots of other people. And then the final thing, like I just mentioned, is that annual fee. Um, you've got a fee that you have to worry about. I would not use a free VPN. As the old saying goes, nothing is ever really free. And it's true. If you're using a free VPN, they have to make money somehow. Like they're, they're not giving a free public service. So what they're going to do is they're probably going to take any data they can from you and sell it to advertisers, or they're going to show you ads, or they're going to put malicious software under your computer. So I would, if at all possible, steer clear. If you're going to be using a VPN, steer clear of any free VPNs. Go ahead and shell out the $50 to $90, depending on which VPN service you use, for a subscription to a quality recommended VPN. Now, I'm going to go ahead and let you know, I'm going to show you this. I showed you Surfshark. There are plenty of others that are good. I'm not going to say that they aren't good. Um, if you want to try Surfshark, you can go to allthingssecure.com slash try slash Surfshark. This is an affiliate link. Uh, you don't have to use it. You can just go straight onto the Surfshark site if you want. This just means that um, you get a better deal and then I will get a commission for that as well. Um, but that's that's not what I'm here for. What I'm here for is just to help you understand these VPN services. And so here is the takeaway here. The very important takeaway that I want you to understand is that to never enter credit card or any sort of login information on a website that doesn't have HTTPS or if, or if it says not secured. And then the next level of that is to use a VPN as a safety net if needed. I'm not going to go saying that a VPN is necessary for every single one of you. If the only time that you use the internet is at home, maybe a VPN isn't really that necessary. You know, you just need to be vigilant and care, you know, be careful about which websites you visit. But if you're constantly traveling or if you're using public Wi-Fi a lot, it's just that extra safety net that might be useful for you. All right, now here are, I'm gonna finish up with this right here, which is some advanced privacy and security tips. And I wanna start by sharing with you a story. We're almost finished here. I wanna share with you a story. Um, and the first, this meme that I can't get a virus, I have a Mac. 
Um, that's been something that perhaps you've heard in the past. Hopefully you guys have had speakers on here before that have debunked this, but Macs are not impervious to viruses and malicious software. They are, especially now that they're so popular, they're just as um, susceptible to that kind of stuff as any other computer is. So don't think that just because you have a Mac that you, you don't have to worry about anything having to do with um, security. The single greatest security flaw, let me see, well, that's not the best way to say it. The single greatest security, um, ah, what's the word I'm trying to think of, threat to you right now. Uh, we've talked about your passwords. We've talked about um, social media and all the information you provide. We've talked about encryption and all that stuff. But the single greatest threat is you. Believe it or not, you are the single greatest threat. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm going to tell you the story. If you guys, I don't know how many of you have ever watched the show Shark Tank. Uh, I love that show. It's, it's a great show. Um, it had features Mark Cuban, guy from Dallas. I'm, I'm a guy from Dallas. But Barbara Cor Corcoran is, um, is one of the sharks, or at least one of the, the recurring sharks on the show. And earlier this year, it was in February of 2020, she was scammed out of $400,000. And it was using a very simple scam that every single one of us can fall for. Um, and she could have been using a VPN, it would have mattered. She could have had the strongest password in the world, it wouldn't have mattered. Why? Because we are our own worst enemy. Here's what happened. Her uh, bookkeeper received an email from Barbara Cochran's assistant that said, hey, here's an invoice, please wire the money to pay for this invoice. Now, that's something that they did often. And it came from a company email address. And so she paid the invoice and then she sent a receipt and sent it to the assistant and to Barbara, who both were like, hey, we didn't send this invoice to you. Why did you pay it? And she said, because you sent it. And what they realized was someone had created a new email address using their company email and just misspelled one letter. Uh, for the assistant's name, and then sent an email to the bookkeeper telling them to send $400,000, and that's what she did. And, like, you can't blame the bookkeeper, necessarily. You can't, can't blame the assistant, but there were some things they could have done and, and things that Barbara has now put in place. Now, thankfully, this happened, and she was able to call up their bank, and they froze the funds before it got sent out to China, which is where the scam had originated. But this is what I like to call the Trojan horse. The Trojan horse um, happens all the time in our email. We get emails. Um, perhaps you even had a friend who's been scammed out of money. Um, a lot of scams have to do with um, what you call it, gift cards, buying gift cards and using those and giving those numbers out. There are so many different scams and scammers out there. So if you can have the best password in the world. And if you can secure your, your social media, and if you can use a VPN and you can still get scammed, then what, what do you have to do? What are things that you can do here? And so I wanna talk about, just finish up here by talking about ways that you can guard against the most common threats to your security and privacy, which is yourself. And the first is this, never, never, never click on a link in an email unless you are absolutely 100% sure you know and trust that person. Um, so for example, um, not because I don't trust George, but he sent me, I believe it was George. Yeah, George sent me a link to, um, to um, what is it, Zoom in order to get on. Now I can click that link and I trust George enough that I could have, but instead what I did is I just took that number and I typed it in instead of clicking that link. And it's just a habit that I've formed. Um, you know, I, I received once an email from Netflix uh, that said, hey, where your billing information is has been out of is now out of date, please click here to uh, enter back in and um, get your billing information and update it. If I had clicked that link, it would have gone to what looked like a Netflix homepage, and I would have been able to log in, and I would have been able to go into a place where I could put in my credit card information, but guess what? That link was actually a link to a fake Netflix website. I checked it out, and if I had put in my login information, I would have given them my login information. And then if I had typed in all my credit card information, I would have given that as well. So what is the other way that I could have avoided that? Always verify using an alternate method. 
This is huge. If you don't hear me on anything else, then I ask you to please hear me on this because this is something I preach to my mom, to my sister, to my dad over and over and over again. Verify using an alternate method. So let's say that your son or your grandkid sends you an email and says, grandma or dad or mom or whoever you are, uh, I am, I just got in a car wreck. I'm in the middle of, you know, some state and city. And the only way I can pay is if you buy some Target gift cards or Best Buy gift cards and give me those numbers. I need you to do that with like right now. Can you please right now go and do that? Now you can email back and say, is this really you? But that's not the the point here is to verify using an alternate method. So even if in the email they say, I don't have my phone, you can't call me, doesn't matter. Call them anyway. Call them and verify using a call. And if you can't verify that way, try to find another way. Call somebody else and ask, hey, where is so-and-so? Are they really driving out in the middle of that place? And try to verify. So if Barbara Corcoran's bookkeeper had just stuck her head out the door and said to the assistant, hey, did you send this invoice for this amount? The assistant would have said, no, I didn't send an invoice. And all of that would have been avoided. Um, And that same way, especially if there's an urgent request, urgently, hey, right now, please, you got to do this. You got to wire some money. You've got to send something or, hey, you've you've won something. And the only way that I'm going to be able to, you've got to get it in by tomorrow. Anytime there's urgency like that, always verify somewhere else. So for the example of Netflix, when Netflix, when I got that email from Netflix, instead of clicking the link, I opened up a new browser window and I went into netflix.com. I typed it in myself. I didn't click the link. I typed it in myself and I went in and found out, nope, my Netflix billing information is up to date. So I went and looked and sure enough, the email on that um, email from Netflix wasn't actually from Netflix. It was like, Netflix billing at gmail.com. I can promise you Netflix isn't going to be sending emails from Gmail. So that's the other thing. You can check the email from address or the website URL carefully. Amazon's not going to send you an email from a Gmail or a Hotmail account. Same for Amazon or same for Netflix or any other service. If it doesn't come from the actual URL, uh, then you need to be very wary. Um, And then Never give out, never, ever give out your social security number or any sensitive info to somebody who has called you. So for example, if I'm dealing with my bank, but somebody from the bank had called me, the bank is never going to request that information over the phone, probably ever over the phone. But even if they call you, let's say it's a credit monitoring bureau, they're never going to call you and ask for that information. So if somebody does that, You say, thank you. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to hang up and I'm going to call you directly. So you're going to go to their website. You're going to call into their, um, that phone number, and then you're going to find out if that's really what you need to do. But you never take an incoming call and give out a lot of this personal information. And the last thing I'm going to say here, yeah, is be skeptical. I, I hate to be that person. Um, you know, I want to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, but the problem is we live in a world on the internet right now where being skeptical, it's the best way to keep yourself safe and secure. You need to be skeptical about what is being sent to you, what you're visiting, messages that you're receiving, even on your phone or your tablet. Just be skeptical. Take that extra moment to ask is this really, does this feel right or not? And then that is going to help you so much in the long run. So that's all I've got right now. I'm going to open this up for questions. But before I do, I just want to say, if you enjoyed this and you want to get some more information about VPNs or just online security in general, I even have a video about how I walk step by step, how to um, how to take and uh, uh, secure your Facebook, you can go to allthingssecure.com slash YouTube, and it will redirect you there. I also have um, a book that I'm writing that if you're interested, uh, or if you have any other information, you can sign up uh, at allthingssecure.com slash nmug. Um, and there, you can just give me your email address. I promise I won't be spamming you with anything. I'll just let you know when that uh, security book, which is meant for people like you and me, just common people, ways that you can, so it goes into even further detail about what I'm talking about right now, ways that you can secure yourself online. So again, I would go to allthingssecure.com.
youtube.com slash youtube and allthingssecure.com slash nmug. And hopefully we can stay connected in that way. I'd love to help in any way possible and to be of assistance to you guys. Um, that's what I have right now. And I would love to kind of open this up to any questions or Cheetah, if you want to take it from here. Hi. Uh, we have quite a few questions for you in the chat. Would you like to start there? Okay. We have sure. Sophia. Sophia, she is. Um, Sophia, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? If not, Sue. I, know, I can see her question. Yeah, you oh, can you, see it. You can go ahead and answer that. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so she, she asked, how often do you change your passwords? Um, and I, I honestly don't change them very often. I know that there's a lot of you know things out there that say you need to change them every three, six months, 12 months. Um, that is really up to you and your level of paranoia. And, and I don't mean that in a negative way. Like I'm, I'm paranoid, um, but I, even I don't change it more than once a year. And even then I would only do it for your really sensitive logins, like your email investments and banking. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say you have to do it every single time. Um, I'll go ahead and go to the next one. Sue Clark asked our uh, physical 2FAs available. So when she says physical 2FAs, she's referring to this right here, this key that I was talking about, two-factor authentication. And yes, they are. You can get those ordered and delivered pretty much anywhere in the world. I got this one. This is a UB key. You can find it on Amazon, um, but you can also, I, I bought it on Amazon and had it delivered out here to Thailand. So you can get those pretty much anywhere. They don't work on every single login. But like my Gmail, I use 2FA, uh, Facebook, I use 2FA, um, and a lot of my um, uh, uh, investment accounts. Unfortunately, most banks don't offer much 2FA keys, but yeah. All right, let's see here. What happens if you lose your USB key or it breaks? That's a great question. So uh, I always have a backup when you're ever you're setting up your 2FA. Uh, there's three different methods of two-factor authentication. There is text message. There is a Google auth or there's an authenticator app. So it's an app on your phone. So if I were to open, well, I'm not going to show you, but if I were to open up my phone, it would show me a, a, a numeric um, a number that I would have to type in. And so I'd have to have my phone with me or the key. And so I always set up two of them so that just in case my key breaks, um, I've got a second method. Or if I lose my phone, I've got this key. But uh, yeah, that's a very good question because you want to make sure that you've got that backup. All right, but worth discussing in the near term. I'm looking at password managers. This is from Victoria. I use one password. There are others. I think it makes a lot of sense to use a manager. She's absolutely right. And I, I am a, a huge proponent of using a password manager. It is beyond the scope of this presentation, but I'd be happy maybe on another date to come back and talk more about it, or maybe you can find somebody else that can talk about it. These are important people, like it's just a, it's a way to securely create stronger passwords and store them without having to remember all of that jumble of, uh, of hard uh, passwords. Does, uh, from Marcia said, does a VPN slow down your Wi-Fi speed? I believe I already answered that, it does, but just hopefully just slightly. Um, Tom, I have an interesting use of a VPN do you want to unmute yourself and share what that might be? Can you hear right, Tom? Yes, we can hear you, Tom. Okay, good. Uh, I'm a Philadelphia Eagles football fan. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's tough being an Eagles football fan. Yes. Generally. Yes. <laughs> but I live in Estero, Florida. And... Uh, they don't, they don't televise Eagles football games in Southwest Florida. So yep. I discovered that there's a thing called an NFL Game Pass. You can buy the NFL Game Pass. It's not cheap. <clears throat> but if you buy it and you use it in the United States, you can watch a recorded game, but you can't watch your favorite football team live. So you set up a VPN. I use Express. VPN. I have no idea why it works. And I typically uh, set it to Frankfurt, Germany. 
And I then go into my, I purchased through that, through Frankfurt, a, a, an NFL game pass paid in US dollars. And when I go in through Frankfurt, uh, I then just do hit NFL game pass, get the game, he remembers that I wanna watch Eagles live on Sundays. And I watch my game and the uh, video is, it's perfect. It's like 4K. It does slow down. And sometimes from Frankfurt, sometimes it slows down a lot and you keep getting missing half a play. So I, I often move it to the Hague. Oh, by the way, one last thing. If you live in the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, including Ireland, Wales, and Scotland are considered US or US type sources. So you got to go outside of US, Canada, and the UK, but it works like a charm. And I also learned today that I should consider using it all year round as a protective device. And I appreciate that. That's a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I, I, yeah, that's exactly right. You've got basically where blackouts when you're trying to watch the NFL um, and because they're trying to encourage you obviously to use, to watch it on TV with their um, partners. And so that's, I mean, I'm, I'm a subscriber to the NFL network as well. I follow Dallas. I'm equally as sad as you are as a Philadelphia fan, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's been good. So, you know, Tom, 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 sorry. Uh, let's go to Carl's question. Uh, Carl Faust, when I have my uh, VPN on, I can't use Thunderbird to connect to my email. Is there a workaround, a way to work around that? Great question. And this is actually getting pretty technical, Carl. So I might, um, I, I, I honestly don't know the answer right now. There are ways that you can open up ports. Um, and so that's something you have to look into. Thankfully with a VPN, it's really easy to just turn it off and turn it back on. So with Thunderbird, um, you could turn it off, you know, check your email and then turn it back on, but there are ways and it's just a, probably a little too technical to go into right now. Okay. Um, let's go to James Corsica. Could you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Hi, Josh. Great presentation. This is a quickie, I think. You suggested that, that we have strong passwords that are different for our banking and for our email. Now I get my email through the Comcast server. Are you saying that I should have a strong password for Comcast? Because I don't know I that would, I have a password for my email. Yes, that would be, I guess in that case, that would be the same for you. Um, making sure that essentially, if, if someone were to go into Comcast and try to pretend that they were you and log in uh, to get your email, they would probably have to use your Comcast um, password. And so that's the one, whatever password it is that allows you access to your email, then that's what I would make sure is, is strong. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. All right, yes, sir. I, I have a quick question um, and it's basically also for Martha Phillips. Could you scroll all the way down to the very last message, Josh, and read the very last yes, message? Okay, iPhone lost the ability to connect online. New iPhone. All right. What was about the VPN? Well, that. I'm not sure I'd be able to answer that without actually seeing the phone. A VPN is only going to be messing with your internet connection. So unless it was a, a VPN, like one of those, again, I don't know what VPN you were using. And so it could have been one that was also in, infecting some sort of malware uh, or, or trying to do something on your phone and your phone was shutting down in order not to be infected. That's also a possibility. It, there are a number of different possibilities here. Yes, Chita. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, and she says it was Tunnel Bear. Um, but Natalie, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? My question is, uh, I have a lot of different passwords and it gets confusing even though I, I uh, keep them in a separate book, but then you change them. 
How do you feel about 1Password? Because I know a lot of people use that and that's what I've been thinking I should go to. Yeah, uh, that is what I use as well. And so I can say, when I can recommend it wholeheartedly. I think it's an excellent piece of software. I think it's really easy to use. And I think it does a good job for what it's meant to do, which is, like I said, helping you create passwords, storing them securely. Um, so, I mean, I, and even if you're using something like Dashlane, Dashlane is also very good. Uh, one password, either of those. LastPass, I don't have much experience with, but I know a lot of people that use that. But yes, one password, if you're using that, you're, you're already doing an excellent job and um, just keep on using that to help create the passwords and store them. I know I've been hacked with my social security number even, and they went to prison, the person that hacked into our social security number. So I'm, wow. I'm especially paranoid about it. Yeah. But thank you. Okay, Linda, can you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Linda Hawson, still there? We can't hear you. We can see you speaking, but we cannot hear you. There you go. All right, go ahead. Can I speak for my wife? I am uh, joining you. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. I get lots of offers for presents or gifts. Fill out the form free. All you have to do is putting shipping uh, cost and in the process, they ask you to fill, uh, put your credit card number. Uh, I always reject those offers. But sometimes there's very tempting offers. What do you say to these offers? I that say involve, what I always say. That involve putting your credit card. Well, yeah. I mean, I think the credit card is a no-brainer. If they're asking for your credit card, unless it's a service that you're signing up for that you want, um, if, if they're giving you something for free, they shouldn't be asking for your credit card. But I'd say even, even a step beyond that, um, and something that, you know, a lot of, it's just become a, a big problem is people want things for free. Like we're, we're drawn to things that are free, but nothing is really free. Um, there's, there's a catch somewhere. Uh, you, you didn't win a car. You didn't win, even if it's a small item, um, there's a catch somewhere. And if you're giving them your, your, even your address information and associating that with your name, that's more information than they had in the past. And they're going to be selling that to somebody. Uh, and it's not worth the free gift. More 95, to, I would even go as far as say 99% of the time, it's not worth the free gift. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We are uh, over our time allotment. George, you want to take over? Yes, uh, Josh. Thank you very, very much. This was a fabulous, fabulous presentation. And we really appreciate your being here. And happy New Year to you and your family. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Happy New Year, right. you guys. Thank you, Josh. Could everyone unmute yeah. yourself and please thank Josh? Thanks, thank Josh. Good. Bravo. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. Nice Great. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Right. Outstanding presentation. Best I think I've ever heard on security. Excellent. Thank Excellent. You. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you. And Josh, we did have more questions, but for time's sake, we weren't able to get to them. Would it be okay to maybe email you some questions? Yes, it would. Thank you so much, Josh. Really appreciate that. Yes, thank you very much and, and, and happy, happy new year. Happy, happy new year. year. Uh, let me just say a few words, uh, if I could. Um, can everybody mute themselves again, if possible? Um, number one, the last class, of the season is on security, the one in March, the last one in March, and Jeff Bohr will be teaching that class and he will cover in depth uh, one password. It, one password is recommended by uh, uh, the Naples Mac user group and uh, we're very much in favor of it. Um, that's it for now. Happy New Year to everyone. And Josh, again, thank you. Thank you.